welcome everyone to our talk. Um, my name is Anna and to, today with me is my colleague Cornelius and we are gonna talk about what we are working on, so runtime security with eBPF. So let's start with a quick intro. Um, my name is Anna, I work at Isovalen on observability mainly, observability for networking and security. These days I'm focusing on uh, Tetragon, which is observability tool that uh, we develop. Cornelius, can you introduce yourself? Um, hi, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Cornelius, I'm a software engineer uh, with Asovelan, now part of Cisco, and I work on Tetragon. All right. So our goal today is to move from observability to enforcement. Uh, we work on two aspects of runtime security with eBPF, observability and enforcement. And observability in security context often means um, inspecting interactions between applications, between workloads and uh, operating system um, because uh, applications need to ask uh, operating system for many, many things they uh, need to do, but also many attack vectors uh, essentially are abusing uh, what application can do, can ask operating system to do. Uh, for example, um, a pod might attempt to load a kernel module uh, when it shouldn't really do it, um, or uh, might access a secret file that it shouldn't really access. Uh, when we are doing observability for security, we can alert on such events and then uh, ask a user, a security engineer, to investigate it, to process data stored in some CM and do something with it. We want to move a step further and do enforcement. So instead of just alerting on whenever a kernel module is loaded, we want to block it instead of just alerting a user whenever um, a file is accessed, a secret file is access accessed. We want to just block it and not allow um, the application to access this file uh, in the first place. Uh, so the outline of our talk. First, we will uh, briefly talk about how eBPF is used for security, observability, and enforcement. We won't cover how eBPF works under the hood. This is not really necessary for this talk. So if uh, you don't know BPF internals, don't worry about it. Uh, then we will cover how um, to build a Tetragon enforcement policy and uh, how this works in a Kubernetes world. So BPF works within Linux kernel. That means on a single machine. Kubernetes is a distributed system of them with a Kubernetes cluster can have like thousand machines. Um, distributed globally. Some interaction between these two worlds, like local and globally distributed, are interesting. So <laughs> we are going to cover this too. And we'll show some uh, exam more examples of uh, policies and some more resources to get started. All right. With this, I will uh, give to Cornelius. Cornelius, can you tell us how eBPF is used for observability and enforcement? Of course. Thanks. So we're going to let's assume that we have a system. In this system, we have a bunch of applications running, and we have a user. And the user has a simple request. They want to generate an alert if an application other than A1 accesses or opens file X. The standard way to do that is to create a user space agent, let's call it an observer, and forward all file accesses from all applications from the kernel to this observer. Then as events happen, the observer will process the messages and try to figure out whether the condition set by the user is satisfied or not. And if it happens, it will generate an alert. So this architecture has the benefit that the kernel part, which is the privileged part, is really, really simple because we just forward all the events. And this means that it has a higher probability of being safe which is really, really important for code that runs inside the kernel. The downside, however, is that we have to copy all of the data from kernel to user space, which wastes both memory and CPU. And so what BPF provides is a way to get 
both benefits uh, in this situation. So uh, eBPF is a programmable and performant in-kernel virtual machine that can safely execute native code on certain hooks. You can think of it as JavaScript for the kernel. And exactly because it's safe, um, there is a kernel verifier. We will not go into the details, but exactly because it's safe, we can get whatever users has requested, compile it into in BPF, and put it as a filter into the kernel. And this means that as events happen, we can filter them at their source. And so we can avoid a lot of copying, we can avoid a lot of memory, and just generate the alert by going from the kernel to the observer and then to the user. The other benefit is now we are in the inline path of the operation, which means that we can also block the operation. So we can now implement other semantics, which are block any application, which is not application A, that tries to open file X. Um, and eBPF gives us the ability to do that. Um, so the benefit in the previous architecture that I showed you is that the filtering logic remains the same. There is no difference. The only difference is what do you do whenever you match. And specifically, we have a different enforcement actions that we support. One is block the operation uh, before it actually happens and return an error to the user application. And we can also send a signal to terminate the application. However, enforcement is different from observability in one crucial aspect. The logic for filtering has to be implemented in the kernel. In observability use cases, in many cases, you can just sit and do the filtering or part of the filtering in user space. When we are talking about enforcement, we need to push all the logic into the kernel, which is a great use case for eBPF. And I put a bookmark there because this is something that's going to come up later again. So now I'll pass it to Anna to uh, tell us about Tetragon. All right. So Tetragon is a tool we are working on. Um, it's an open source tool under the Cilium project umbrella, so it's part of CNCF, and it's using eBPF. Um, it's using eBPF in a pretty, pretty generic way, so uh, it's really a tool that allows you to uh, hook into any point in the Linux kernel and get um, events or metrics for whenever this hook point is executed. Um, it has in kernel filtering and enforcement, as Cornelia said. Uh, it is Kubernetes native. So uh, that means that it operates on Kubernetes metadata like namespaces or pod labels, not just low level kernel stuff. Uh, both Tetragon policies uh, are configured with, um, with Kubernetes. They are Kubernetes CRDs, but they um, are configured with Kubernetes metadata and events and metrics produced by Tetragon um, also contain this Kubernetes metadata. So this is uh, like a picture from the front page of Tetragon documentation. Uh, there is a lot happening here, so I will uh, go through different sections quickly. Um, so because Tetragon is pretty generic tool, it can support gazillion different use cases. Uh, starting from basic things like uh, process execution, um, this is kind of the uh, basic use case uh, that Tetragon users start with, um, to things like network connections, file access, and uh, various um, events that may ind indicate uh, privilege escalation, like namespace changes or uh, capability list changes. Because we use eBPF, um, Tetragon is very reliable and gives us security with very low overhead. Thanks to eBPF Verifier, the programs are safe to run, and they give us complete visibility, meaning that they see everything that is happening on the node. The applications running on the node can't hide from Tetragon. This is something very important from a security standpoint, because security engineers are not happy if you tell them that, oh, some applications can just hide and we just can't.
can't see them. Now, this doesn't happen with Tetragon it, um, because it runs BPF programs in kernel. It can see everything. Um, there is in kernel uh, enforcement and filtering, uh, and because uh, we are saving on this uh, user kernel uh, context switches, and we also filter and aggregate in kernel, um, we generally can do a lot efficiently. Mm. The Tetragon uh, agent running in user space um, and um, loading uh, BPF programs into the kernel, it can run on any Linux system, it can run on Kubernetes. This is something we are going to focus on today because, well, this is KubeCon, uh, but it can also run outside of Kubernetes on uh, in VMs or bare metal machines. And uh, Tetragon doesn't care about what applications are really running on the node. They can be written in any language, use any framework. Um, when Tetragon uh, starts um, observing them or enforcing security policies, uh, these applications don't need to be reconfigured, restarted, nothing. Uh, they just keep running as they were. And last but not least, uh, Tetragon integration. So Tetragon used as security observability tool produces events and metrics that then can be pushed into your favorite security observability vendor, essentially. So uh, things like Splunk, Elastic, uh, metrics are usually scraped by Prometheus. Um, we also see we are also seeing people using Tetragon to like build some more specialized custom data pipelines on top of it because again it is so generic it can be used as a sort of building block for uh, building more specialized tool. All right, so that was a quick overview of Tetragon. Now let's actually get uh, to the, the topic of this talk and. Let's try to build a Tetragon enforcement policy. So uh, our quest for today is to block access to a secret file. Let's say the secret file might be some password token, whatever. Uh, we don't want an attacker to access it. And this is my first policy I, I wrote to do this. Uh, Tetragon is configured via tracing policy CRD, and this is very low level configuration. It's almost like a way to interact and build uh, interactive kernel and build an eBPF based tool, but without writing BPF code. We are operating here on um, kernel functions and arguments they, they take. So in a Tetragon policy, we defined exactly where we want to hook in the kernel. In this case, it's, it's a K probe and it's actually a system call, uh, open at system call, a system call responsible for opening a file. Uh, so we are hooking there and we define an action. So an action is the thing in the policy that does the enforcement bit, not just observability. And my action is to sick kill, um, send a sick kill signal, so kill a process that is trying to uh, read my extremely secret file. So I try to, I load this policy, I run it and try to uh, read, cut the file the process was killed. It works. Cornelius, what do you think about my policy? So I think this is a great policy and it definitely achieves what we want, but it has a minor, minor issue, which is it blocks access to every file in the system, which some people might not want. Uh, so for example, if you try to access another file, the process will still be killed, uh, which some people will say it's not ideal. So what we can do is that we can take the policy a step further. Uh, you can see this is the same policy with the changes being highlighted and Tetragon policies allow you to access arguments and then filter on these arguments. So the first argument of the system call that we're using is the file name. So now we can filter and only apply this policy if the first argument is equal to my extremely uh, secret file, which is um, what we want. How does it look, Anna? Okay, this looks definitely better, but I see a problem with this policy too, because blocking all access to the file is not what we usually want. Like, let's assume this file is some secret, like it's some password. Um, there is probably an application that actually needs to read this file, needs to read this password to do something. So. 
when I, um, uh, whatever application um, is trying to read this file, um, it is just blocked. Um, I have another binary here, my cat, that I want actually uh, to read this file and not to be killed, and I can't do this. Uh, this policy blocks access for every single process uh, on the system. So what we can do is we can block um, file access only for specific binaries. In this case, um, we are allowing access to a file only to my cat binary and blocking everything, uh, all other binaries. And this is better, um, I think. What do you think, Cornelius? So I, I think it's definitely better, um, but turns out writing Tetragon policies is kind of tricky sometimes, and there are some issues with this policy. So the first issue is that we are uh, hooking into the open ad system call. And most applications, including CAT, the standard Unix utility, use this system call, but they don't have to. There are other applications that use other system calls, for example, open. I've written one here, called it evil CAT, and using this application, I can actually access the file. Furthermore, um, because we are hooking into this trace point, which is a system call, the file name, which we were filtering, resides in user memory. And this means that we just introduced a time of check, time of use bug. Um, so what happens is that because the memory is in user space, the user program is allowed to change it. And this means that at a point after the BPF check, where everything seems OK, something like another thread from a user's process can go and change the binary. And this means that the open will be actually executed with not the one that we checked, but another uh, file name. And then this is a way to bypass um, the policy. Um, fortunately, um, oh, and there, is, there are a couple more issues. So another issue is that we specify the full path as access to the system call, but obviously we can call with different path names. We can sit into a directory and call the, from the current directory, and then again the, the policy would not be applied. Finally, and this is a bit tricky, there are cases where when we define a signal as an action, um, the system call side effects will stick, still take place. So for example, there are instances where if we say write this buffer into the file and then we enforce on that system call with a seek kill, then again, there are certain situations where this happens, but it is possible that the data will actually be written to the file, which is not what we want. Um, so yeah, there are several problems with this policy. Um, Anna, any ideas? Yeah, so the problem here is that we are hooking to, to a syscall and to open up syscall and um, it turns out this is not actually a good place to hook into for enforcement. It might be good for observability to ob observe like syscall uh, calls, but uh, for enforcement, um, not really. This is the um, signature of the syscall in, in the kernel and uh, as Cornelius pointed out, the first problem is that an, an argument to this function that we are trying to filter on is a pointer to user memory. So um, an attacker that has access to this memory can manipulate it somehow and pretend that they, they are doing something else that they are doing. Uh, and second thing is enforcement action. So sending a SQL signal is not enough. What we want to do for enforcement is we would like to overwrite the value returned by a kernel function. And for syscalls, this might be not supported sometimes. So what we need, really need to do here is we need to find a better hook point for enforcement. And such a better hook point is 
uh, security hook, uh, that, uh, which is uh, explicitly defined for Linux security modules. Uh, Linux security modules cover like, certain areas of uh, Linux kernel and security file open is um, like LSM hook um, that is called on all file open operations. An argument here is uh, file struct, which is not a pointer to user memory, but actual struct that is actually used by uh, the kernel to do the operation. So uh, it's much uh, more secure to um, actually use in the enforcement mode. Um, and here we have uh, a better enforcement policy uh, that is uh, achieving a similar thing that, that the previous policy do, but we, instead of hooking to uh, open up syscall, we are hooking to uh, this LSM hook, security file open, which is not a syscall. Uh, instead of filtering on the file path, uh, we um, filter on this file struct. Um, the filtering section looks kind of similar, but uh, this is this low level detail that we are using actual different piece of memory, a different argument for um, filtering. And uh, in the action section, we are still sending a signal, but we also want to override the value returned uh, by the function to uh, not return zero. That would indicate a successful um, operation, but um, to, over, uh, to uh, return negative value. So this is our final policy for, enforce, for enforcing access to my extremely secret file and lock uh, attacker access to it. Now let's move on to the Kubernetes world. How do we apply this, all of this in the Kubernetes world? So in the Kubernetes world, one of the things that we need to do is to selectively apply these policies in different types of workloads. Uh, otherwise, there's not much sense in having a global policy for every workload that runs in our nodes. And in Tetragon, we achieve this with two ways. The first is with namespaced policies. So this is a policy that has a namespace kind of scope, and it will only be applied to workloads running in this namespace. And then in addition to that, we have a more flexible pod label filter construct where you can define expressions on pod label filters, deciding whether a policy will be applied or not. And as I mentioned in the beginning, for enforcement, it's crucial that these semantics are pushed down to the kernel, pushed down to the eBPF level. And next, I'm going to discuss how we actually do that. So um, the way we do it is by using C groups. So C groups are one of the two me main mechanisms, the other being namespaces that Kubernetes and container runtimes use to implement containers in Linux. Uh, C groups are basically a way to hierarchically organize kind of applications and resources. So think of it as a tree where there is a root, which is basically the machine. And then what you would see in a typical Kubernetes node is that the first split between Kubernetes pods, uh, which is kind of one node, and another which is host workloads, uh, typically managed by system D, but we don't really care about that at this point. And then at the Kubernetes level, there is still a split based on the quality of service of the different pods. And then you also get one C group per pod. And then for every container, you also get one level deeper, um, one C group per container. So basically what we do is that for the filtering, we match the container to the C group. And then inside the kernel, we filter based on the C group. And the way we do that is uh, by having state uh, we keep this state into a BPF map that is accessed by the program, and then we ask, does this C group, uh, or rather, does this policy is, um, should be applied to a given C group? And then if yes, we continue with the execution of the BPF code. Um, so if a policy is loaded, then we update the map, the BPF map, uh, 
if something changes in the Kubernetes API server, for example, a new pod is created, a new container is created, or a new, or maybe a pod label changed, then we go and update the map to keep the state up to date. So let's see an example. Let's see the example of starting a container. So Tetragon agent is informed about this uh, new pod. So, or this, and then it, it scans all of its containers and then for every container we find its C group and then we add it to the map. Then uh, the, kubelet, the kubelet talks to the uh, container runtime and then the container is created, it does the operation and then everything works as expected. However, this is not necessarily the order that the events can happen. There is no guarantee. In fact, the events can happen in the opposite order. First, the container is created and then it starts running and it might even start executing operations before the state is actually updated. And this is problematic because the policy will not be applied in this case. So we need to do something better. Um, and what we do is we use runtime hooks. So runtime hooks are a way for Tetragon or any other application to hook into the container runtime system. And what we do when we hook is basically we say to the container runtime system, every time you create a new container, do this. And by this, in this case, we contact the Tetragon agent before the container starts, set everything up, the state is ready, and then once we're done, we go back to the runtime and say, yeah, everything's good, you can now start the container, the container starts, and we have ensured that every operation will be subject to the policy if the uh, corresponding labels match. So Tetragon runtime hooks are implemented in a different daemon set. Uh, it's called Tetragon uh, RT hooks. And there are two interfaces, one which is OCI hooks, where basically you drop a file into a directory. This is, we, this is something that we use for cryo. And there's another interface called NRI, uh, which is uh, used for container D. Uh, recently, NRI was enabled by default in the recent release of container D for 2.0. And it's also supported um, by cryo. So, this is very useful for us uh, because it lets us do things in security that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So, I don't know, if you work on NRI or you know somebody working on NRI, uh, say thank you from us. Another issue that exists in Kubernetes uh, setups is what happens if the agent goes down. And there are some agents that never go down, but the Tetragon agent tip there are some cases where it will go down. For example, if we want to do an upgrade. So if we want to do an upgrade, we need to take the, stop the old version of Tetragon running and start the new one. And the question is what happens with the enforcement? So by default, the Tetragon agent will unload all the BPF programs, which means that the enforcement will stop working for as long as the agent is down. In certain situations, this is undesirable. So uh, we've introduced a flag uh, where basically you can say to Tetragon, if you exit, keep, don't remove the BPF programs. And so let's say that the Tetragon starts, the Tetragon agent starts, we load the BPF programs, we load the BPF mar marks, everything's running, enforcement is working, and then the Tetragon agent goes down. At this point, if this flag is enabled, the program skips running. This means that enforcement will continue to happen based on the old state. Since the Tetragon agent is not running, there is no way to update, I don't know, any state that I've talked about, either new pods or changes in containers or new pod labels. Um, once the Tetragon agent starts again, it will kind of move to the new version, it will install new programs, and then um, everything would work as before. And then if you want to remove the programs, um, you can set this flag to false, which means that once the Tetragon agent stops, all the programs will be removed. Um, 
Yeah, so Anna now is going to tell us how to get started with Tetragon enforcement policies. All right, so uh, just to, to reiterate um, what uh, Cornelius was talking about, we can use, in Tetragon tracing policy, we can use um, Kubernetes labels, pod labels as uh, filters, and uh, this pod, uh, we define them in a pod selector uh, section of a policy, and this, this is the thing that will actually be propagated to the kernel um, stored in a BPF map so that we can do filtering in kernel. And going a step further, um, there are uh, a few other selectors available in um, Tetragon policy, uh, but one that is very interesting in Kubernetes context is that we can uh, restrict file access, for example, only um, to allow access only from the pod, but not allow it from everywhere else. For example, not allow users manually running kubectl exec to read some uh, secret file. So uh, in this policy, uh, it's truncated to fit on a slide, but in this policy, we uh, still um, allow uh, secret file access to the pod, but we use a PID filter to not allow um, users running to, exec to, to access this file. Um, another example uh, that uh, we mentioned in the first slide, uh, blocking um, loading kernel modules. Loading kernel modules is highly privileged operation that some tools do, some tools that um, haven't uh, discovered BPF yet, for example, uh, but it's not something that just should happen randomly in, uh, in a system. Uh, to block loading kernel modules, we can use uh, this three uh, hook points. Again, these are uh, LSM hooks, a security kernel module request, kernel read file, uh, kernel load data, and uh, again, we can override um, the return value to return an error and send a signal. Uh, we will need to filter on arguments to these functions to um, filter only the module, uh, kernel module um, operations. I won't show a full policy for this. I will leave it as uh, homework for you all to write the policy uh, that is blocking uh, kernel modules from being loaded. Uh, but if you don't feel like writing a policy, you can also check out um, examples directory, example slash tracing policy directory in Tetragon repository. Uh, so Tetragon policies are very low level and we know that it's not an easy task to write them in general. This is why um, Tetragon community is collecting lots and lots of example policies for different use cases in this um, examples directory. Uh, there's also a policy library, which is sort of a more curated and better documented collection of example policies. In Tetragon documentation, um, tetragon.io, you can find uh, like document policies for uh, several specific use cases. Um, to learn more, uh, visit Tetragon documentation. Um, Tetragon.io. Uh, Tetragon is on GitHub, uh, it's open source as, uh, under Cilium organization. And uh, we also have labs, like hands on labs, where you can try out Tetragon without uh, messing up with your machine. Um, and we have books which can be downloaded for free from Isovalent website. Um, if you visit Isovalent booth, then you can do laps over there and you will get some like batch, like a sticker for, <laughs> for completing a batch. Uh, and you also have a book, book signings. So uh, today, just after this talk, I think um, there is book signing with uh, Liz Rice. Um, and tomorrow lunchtime, uh, there will be book signing with our colleague Natalia uh, with security, obs uh, security observability with EBPF book, which covers some of the stuff that we talked about today. Um, we also have a country fest, the first ever country fest, uh, Tetragon country fest, which is tomorrow. Um, come to contribute or learn, help getting started, submit your homework that I gave you, or discuss your ideas. Um, and uh, at this point, I would like to also thank all Tetragon contributors uh, who helped with 
uh, code with writing policies, documentation, or re reported uh, bugs to us. Uh, this is uh, really, really helpful. And after KubeCon, let's stay in touch. Uh, we have Tetragon community meeting. Tetragon community meeting is happening monthly. Um, the, you can find information uh, on this link on the slide. And uh, we are also on Slack. We are all on Cilium and DBP Slack uh, in Tetragon channel. So uh, you can ask all your questions uh, there. And that's it from us. Thank you very much. Right. If you have any questions, then mics are over there, and you can also find us around over the week. I have a quick question. Is there a possibility of deploying the hooks on the Detragon daemon set itself instead of separate one? Like, there's already too many demon sets out there. The OCI hooks you talked about. Can you repeat? Sorry, I didn't. Um, for the deploying the hooks into the Kubernetes, you mentioned that is deployed with the daemon set, right? The arc. Isn't it the old OCI hooks you talked about? So, are you talking how you deploy the Tetragon policy or? No, the hooks. The, the, the hooks. CRI hooks. The CRI, CRI. CR, yeah, okay. runtime hooks. How they are deployed? Is that yeah. I think you mentioned that it's deployed using daemon set. Yeah, yeah. But the Tetragon itself also deployed using separate daemon set, right? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So they are deployed by the Helm uh, chart. So the Helm chart has configuration. And then if you do Helm install Tetragon with the proper configuration, it will all, also install, install the Tetragon artichokes daemon set. Yeah, that's correct. But like, there's already two daemon sets. Where is it possible uh, they're yeah. merging what, into one? Is the question why do we need two daemon sets? Why two daemon sets? Ah, yeah. Yeah. So, the first version was actually on the same daemon set, but this doesn't work well because we need the hook to be to run even if the agent is down, because then we can actually say to the configure the hook to stop the container from starting. Because if the agent, if, if we restart the agent or the Tetragon daemon set, there will be no hook. Okay. Got it. There could be like in each container that could deploy the hook too, right? So. For NRI, it needs to be a service. It needs to be running. I see, okay. If you want more details, feel free to, to kind of grab me and we can discuss uh, for a long time. <laughs> Is there uh, another question? Yeah, I have another one. Uh, on that policy, you were uh, specifying uh, that uh, argument uh, with some specific index, index zero. If I would uh, provide uh, additional argument and uh, the position will change, uh, how that policy would work? I mean, you are in the policy, you operate on um, kernel functions, right? Mm -hmm. So the arguments you specify there are arguments taken by this kernel function that you are hooking into. If um, different, so in general, when writing policies, uh, you know, part of the whole difficulty of writing policies is finding right hook points that are first secure and second stable. Uh, that means working on multiple kernel versions that we want to support and also multiple distributions. If it happens that um, you know, on different uh, kernel versions, this function has different arguments, then the policy will not support both of them, right? Um, but yeah, but these arguments there are, you know, you, you, you kind of read them from the kernel code and you just define in the policy which uh, arguments you want to filter on, also which arguments you want to, for example, include in the events that are exported. So uh, it's not the argument in the command line, so uh, where we were uh, putting a cat uh, some file and uh, that, that wasn't that? Okay. No. It's the argument of the hook. Okay, okay. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it looks like pretty much perfect thing for you know put the security runtime. 
So how do you think, how do you describe the situation, what's missing and the milestones for Sorry? future development? Oh. For future development? Yeah, what do you, how do you describe what's missing and uh, cool. what, what kind of like uh, features are you guys so going to work? Can I start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have the mechanism, but writing policies is really tricky. And what we started doing is providing some policies as an example. But specifically for enforcement, this can be really problematic because like observability worst case scenario will generate an event. But if you start killing somebody's processes, then that's not a very good thing. So like having a way, so in my mind, the challenges are two. Having a way to write these policies, enable people for different platforms, for different setups to write these policies, and also have a way to explain to the operator what happened. So because we generate an event or we, we kind of enforce somewhere because, I don't know, like some privilege change, like a very low level um, kernel thing, but it might not be clear to the operator what actually went wrong. So I, I think the mechanism is in a pretty good state. The okay. challenge is how, like, how can we bring it to the end user, if, if that makes sense. So, so you're I, talking about like a user experience, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah so I think that uh, I'm, I'm seeing Tetragon as um, a kind of a building block almost for um, more specialized tools. This is what we are starting to, to see in the community that people are taking Tetragon and using it as a building block to uh, build some more specialized tool um, for, for specific security use cases. So write a policy and then either, uh, either write an enforcement policy or write an observability policy and then process the events somehow. So yeah, I think like <laughs> what is, what is um, difficult there and what, yeah. is, what is kind of uh, missing and where we w could get, uh, could use more help from, from the community is like, like writing policies and kind of using Tetragon for specific use cases and improving user experience for specific use cases. Okay, thanks. Good to know. If there are other questions, please come and grab us. Yeah. Uh, we'll be around. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.